Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CISSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major recovery strategy topics in Domain 7 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the fifth of six videos for Domain 7. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are one part of our complete CISSP masterclass. The recovery strategies we're about to discuss are all about getting parts, systems, and even whole data centers back online if there's a failure, or even building in redundancy so that we don't have any downtime at all in the event of a failure. The closer we get to making systems fully redundant, to minimize downtime, the more expensive that the solution is going to be. And conversely, if we want to save costs, it typically means longer downtimes in the event of a failure. Ultimately, what should drive the decision of how quickly a system needs to be recovered or the amount of redundancy required is a business decision. The owner of the system needs to determine what is cost justified based on their business needs. Before we get into talking about different recovery strategies, we first have to talk about three different failure modes, three different ways that we can design systems to fail. Fail soft means we design a system to fail to a less secure state. For example, a firewall designed to fail soft might let all traffic through in the event it fails. This is why fail soft is often referred to as fail open. Fail secure is the inverse. Fail secure means we design a system to fail to a more secure state. So for example, a firewall designed to fail secure might block all traffic in the event that it fails. This is why fail secure is often referred to as fail closed. Fail safe is completely different from the first two. Fail-safe are physical security mechanisms that are designed in such a way to prioritize the safety of people above all else in the event of a failure. Doors in a building unlocking when the fire alarm goes off is a great example of a fail-safe mechanism. Prioritizes the safety of people. All right, let's now start with backup strategies. Various methods we can use to backup data in the event hardware fails. But before we get into discussing the strategies, let's talk about an important bit known as the archive bit. Metadata is, of course, data about data. And the archive bit is an example of metadata. Every file on a computer has an archive bit associated with it. If the, bit is set, if the archive bit is set to zero, no backup is required. An operating system will automatically flip the archive bit to one whenever a file is created or modified, meaning the file needs to be backed up. Okay, now let's talk about different backup strategies. Mirror backups, also known as stream backups, is an exact copy with no compression, no attempt to shrink the backup file size, meaning mirror backups are very fast, but they use a lot of storage space. Full backups are where every file is backed up regardless of what the archive bit is set to. Full backups employ compression, so they're not quite as fast as mirror backups. Incremental backups are where we back up every change since the last incremental backup. Incremental backups are where we back up every change since the last incremental backup. Every time we perform an incremental backup, the archive bit is reset to zero for every file that is backed up, which means you are only backing up the files that have been created or modified since the last backup. This minimizes storage space required for backups, but it can lead to lengthy recovery times as multiple incremental backup tapes may need to be pulled and run sequentially. Differential backups are where we back up changes since the last full backup. The archive bit is left set to 1 for every file that is backed up during a differential backup, which means during every differential backup, you're backing up all new and modified files since the last full backup. This uses more storage space, but it speeds up recovery times, as the maximum number of tapes you'll ever need to pull is 2, the most recent full backup and the most recent differential. Here's a summary of the different types of backups. It is important to validate that backups are occurring correctly. This can be done in numerous ways, including cyclical redundancy checks, CRC checks, checksums, bit-for-bit -bit comparisons of the backup to the original data, or just spot checking select files. And these verification checks can be done while the backup is being performed and also periodically on shelled tapes. It's also important to think about where the backup data is being stored, how long it's retained, and how to make the backup process more efficient. Backups should be stored off-site, ideally in a geographically remote location from the primary system or data center. 
it's a wee bit pointless having great backups if they were located right beside the primary system that just burned the ground and or floated away in a flood. Tape rotation schemes are different methods of keeping backup tapes for a period of time and then reusing the tapes, overwriting the old data with new data. The exact rotation scheme that an organization chooses needs to be driven by the retention policy, which is driven by regulatory and contractual requirements, restoration needs, and costs, etc. The recovery point objective is the maximum tolerable data loss an organization is willing to accept as a measurement of time. Five seconds worth of data, five minutes worth of data, five hours worth of data, five days, you get the point. I raise the RPO here as it is a major driver of the cost of a backup solution. The shorter the RPO, the less data an organization is willing to lose as a measurement of time means the more expensive the backup solution is going to be. So if an owner wants to reduce associated costs with backups, they may need to look at reducing their RPO requirement. Now let's switch topics slightly and talk about spare parts, spare power supplies, spare RAM, spare hard drives, etc any type of part you might need in a system. A cold spare is simply one of these spare parts on a shelf somewhere. With cold spares, if the primary power supply, for example, fails, the system is definitely going down and it's probably going to be for a matter of minutes, hours, or even longer, depending on how long it takes to get the spare part off the shelf and installed in the system so it can be brought back online. A warm spare is a spare part installed in a system but not powered on and ready to go. With warm spares, if the primary part fails, the system is still going down, but recovery time will be much shorter as someone just needs to manually walk over to a system, flip a switch to switch over to the spare part and get the system back up and running. Hot spares are spare parts installed in the system and they are powered on and ready to go. So if the primary part fails, there will be an automatic switch over to the spare part and the system will remain up and running. Now let's talk about how we can use multiple hard drives simultaneously to achieve greater speed, greater redundancy, or both. RAID 0, also known as striping, uses two or more hard drives. When a file is sent to the RAID controller, the file is split into two pieces. The first file is written to the first hard drive, and the second half of the file is written to the second hard drive. RAID 0, therefore, is all about speed, because we've essentially doubled our read-write speed but at the expense of redundancy. RAID 0 at least doubles the chance of data loss because if one of these drives fails, you've lost half your file, which is essentially all of your file. So RAID 0 is all about speed. RAID 1, also known as mirroring, uses two or more hard drives. When a file is sent to the RAID controller, the file is copied. The first entire copy of the file is written to the first hard drive, and the second entire copy of the file is written to the second hard drive. RAID 1, therefore, is all about redundancy, because if we lose a hard drive, we still have a complete copy of the file on the other drive. So RAID 0 equals redundancy. It's not listed here because you now already know what it is. RAID 10 or RAID 1 plus 0 is RAID 1 and RAID 0 together. RAID 10, therefore, requires a minimum of four hard drives. A file is mirrored and then striped, creating four separate fragments of data which are written to four different hard drives, giving you speed and redundancy. RAID 5 is meant to be the happy medium. You get nearly the speed of RAID 0, you get the redundancy of RAID 1, and you don't need quite as many hard drives as RAID 10. RAID 5 requires a minimum of three hard drives. When a file comes into the RAID controller, it is split, striped in half, just like in RAID 0, and then the magic happens. Some parity data is calculated using exclusive OR math. This magical parity data allows you to reconstruct either of the original file fragments with the remaining piece and the magical parity data. These three chunks of data, the two original pieces of the file and the parity data, are written to three different hard drives. The last flavor of RAID that I'll briefly mention here is RAID 6. RAID 6 is very similar to RAID 5 in that it provides speed and redundancy, but RAID 6 adds an additional parity protection such that two hard drives, any two hard drives can fail and the data can still be recovered. RAID 6 essentially provides double data redundancy. And here's a handy dandy summary of the different flavors, types of RAID. Remember the minimum number of hard drives required for each type of RAID.
High availability systems means we want a system that doesn't go down in the event of a failure. We want redundancy at the system level. We can achieve high availability through clustering and redundancy. Clustering means we have multiple systems working together simultaneously to support a workload. Think a cluster of web servers sitting behind a load balancer. If one of the members of the cluster goes down, the cluster is still running, but at reduced capacity. Redundancy means there are multiple systems, a primary and one or more secondary systems. These systems are not working together. Rather, the primary is doing all the work. And if the primary fails, the secondary system will take over to fully support the workload. Okay, now let's talk about how we can recover not just part of a system or a system, but whole data centers. We're going to talk through the different types of recovery sites, starting from the cheapest option, which requires the most time to recover, and building on up to near sites, which cost a ton of money, but can potentially have zero downtime if the primary site goes down. A cold site is basically just the empty shell of a building. No cabling has been run. No server racks are in place. No expensive equipment like servers, no data, no people. So a cold site is cheap, but it can take weeks to get a cold site up and running. A warm site is a shell of a building, plus the cheap equipment like cabling and racks, but no expensive equipment like servers, no data, and no people. A little more expensive, and recovery time is down to days. A hot site is the building, the cheap equipment, the expensive equipment, all set up and ready to go. All that is missing is the data and potentially the people to operate the site. Put another way, a hot site is a fully equipped data center. Hot sites are obviously much more expensive. But now our recovery time is down to a matter of hours, maybe even a number of seconds, as I'll talk about in a moment. There are actually a couple of subtypes of hot sites. The first is a mobile site, which is simply a hot site on wheels, typically a shipping container crammed with equipment. Mobile sites can be moved to where they are needed, and all that is required to get them up and running is data and people. So recovery times for a mobile site are hours or possibly days if you have to transport the mobile site across the country first. And the second subtype of hot site is a mirror or redundant site. A mirror site is a fully operational data center, staffed and running 24 by 7. A mirror site is a fully operational data center operating in parallel with the primary site. So huge costs. But recovery times for a mirror site can be seconds and possibly even instantaneously depending on how it has been architected. The RTO, the recovery time objective, is what's going to drive an order to select between these different recovery solutions. Here is a summary of the different recovery site strategies. Any of these redundant sites should be built in a geographically remote location from the primary site. Geographically remote does not imply any exact distance, but rather far enough away from the primary site such that whatever disaster has befallen it, earthquake, hurricane, flood, wildfires, massive power outage, etc., will not affect the recovery site. That's geographically remote. All right, and that is an overview of recovery strategies within Domain 7, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the exam. If you're looking for an in-depth CISSP study guide, you should check out our book, <laughs> Destination CISSP is a Concise Guide. We wrote the book to be as concise as possible and engaging to read with lots of tables, diagrams, summaries, etc. We cover all of these recovery strategies in detail, along with other major topics that you need to know for the exam. You can find out more details in our guidebook here at destercom forward slash CISP guide. Thank you.